There's a lot of talk about mitigation measures right now to prevent a second wave of COVID-19. Of course, that assumes a first wave has ended, and in some places, that's not clear. This has resulted in plenty of discussion about contact tracing, but not as much about surveillance. This week's video has been adapted from a piece in my blog, The Incidental Economist, written by Dr. Meredith Matone and Deanna Marshall from Policy Lab at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. They assert that it's time to talk about the importance of surveillance measures, and they propose a precision public health approach that pairs such measures with targeted contact tracing. That's the topic of this week's healthcare triage. As communities reopen across the country, strategies for preventing another wave of widespread COVID-19 transmission are top of mind. Arguably, contact tracing is the approach receiving the most media attention and around which many states are mobilizing, and we've talked about it a lot here at Healthcare Triage. Contact tracing is a highly effective cornerstone of infectious disease mitigation that is regularly deployed to help control diseases like HIV, influenza, and measles. A version is even used to identify the source of foodborne illness outbreaks. But these scenarios may not be overly generalizable to our current SARS-CoV-2 reality. We should be talking more about surveillance to improve early detection of potential outbreaks, protect vulnerable populations, and use testing resources smartly. First, we may lack testing resources and coordinated state-level testing procedures to render contact tracing a viable method of population-level transmission mitigation. Second, the evidence to support contact tracing strongly suggests it is most effective in places where the number of circulating cases is low. This doesn't describe much of the country. Third, COVID has both a long period of infectiousness and a pre-symptomatic, possibly asymptomatic spread. This makes contact tracing difficult because its success relies on an individual's ability to recall contacts while contagious, including prior to feeling ill. Fourth, while evidence suggests contact tracing and associated quarantine policies do not require 100% compliance to be effective, compliance will present an inequitable burden to individuals in under-resourced communities. These challenges are real, but contact tracing must be done. The scope and focus are likely best served among medically high-risk populations and those in employment or residential settings with high exposure risks, and maybe not as part of an effort to mass test and trace the general population. So what can we do? Supplement with surveillance. First, implement an enhanced surveillance model featuring syndromic and participatory methods. We can adapt and leverage current public health surveillance for influenza, combined with standardized reporting of hospitalization data. Basically, we monitor health system reports of phone calls from patients not feeling well, of visits to the doctor, et cetera, et cetera, and watch for concerning spikes. It works. We can supplement this with participatory disease surveillance, which involves individuals actively reporting illness symptoms through a website, a text messaging survey, or engagement with community health workers. There are promising examples of web-based reporting platforms for influenza surveillance in Europe and Canada. Participatory surveillance systems have detected outbreaks earlier than traditional surveillance, can be anonymous to some extent, and can be successful without even close to universal participation. Larger employers and schools may also opt to implement other surveillance metrics, including absence monitoring or smart thermometer use, and this information could be coordinated with health departments. Additionally, direct outreach to communities like refugee or homeless populations can help expand these efforts to individuals who may be unlikely to seek health care, those with limited English proficiency, and those with limited internet or phone connectivity. A community-based approach use an Ebola response, employs community health workers to identify symptoms through door-to-door -door visits, and enlists trusted community leaders or institutions to help collect data. This approach has been effective with as little as 40% participation. Second, we could double down on prioritized testing for high-risk populations. Focusing testing on high-risk groups maximizes the benefits of testing and contact tracing. Further, there are efficient testing approaches like pooled testing, that preserve critical supplies and minimize the number of tests needed. Third, we could consider community-level quarantine protocols. It's essential that communities be nimble in moving into brief periods of local mitigation procedures, like closure of non-essential businesses during outbreaks. State and local policymakers should use surveillance and testing data to make real-time decisions about whether or not to enact these protocols in areas with lots of cases. This kind of targeted entry into community-level mitigation may produce fewer and shorter periods of closure. 
An approach that relies on strategic use of foundational public health operations is likely to meet the challenge of resource constraints without compromising quality or perpetuating inequality. It's not too late for states to enact such approaches to protect against another wave of COVID-19. Hey, did you like this episode? You might enjoy this previous episode on dexamethasone, toilet plumes, and rising COVID cases. We'd also appreciate it if you'd like and subscribe down below. And if you'd go on over to patreon.com slash healthcare triage and consider supporting the show, help us get through this pandemic. We'd like to especially thank our research associates, James Glasgow, Joe Sevitz, Josh Gister, and Michael Chin, and of course, our Surgeon Admiral Sam.